Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine. I'm the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. It's truly a privilege to have you with us today. It's our desire to help you come to know God. If there is anything we can do to help you, we'd love to have you call us. The number's on the screen, or you can contact us on the website that's listed below. Once again, we appreciate you being here. If there's anything we can do to help you, please contact us. singing a song called Bittersweet. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's table at the end of the service this morning, but this song has to do with that. This celebration, this time around the Lord's table, is bittersweet. We celebrate the cup, but that represents the shed blood, the bread, which represents the broken body of our Lord. Say, so I trust that you'll pay attention to the words and be thinking about those as we later on prepare to uh, look at the Lord's table this morning.
and he will raise you up on eagle's wings. There you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. to the Lord, my refuge, my rock, in whom I trust, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you Thank you, Tacey, so much for that. Really appreciate that number. You all know that Worthy of Worship is my favorite song. That's the one I love singing more than anyone. So, man, when I sing that song, I like to just sing as loud as I can. I just love that song. And some of you didn't even sing on it. <laughs> That's disgraceful <laughs> when you got such a good song like that. We are going to be preaching a message today on continuing in exaltation. I've been working, working on writing this book on this subject of continue. We started in January and um, I think we've got, uh, we've been preaching on it for many, many weeks and I told you that it was, I was through with preaching on it and then in writing this book I have to have one more sermon. This one is extremely important. And so I'm going to have you take your Bible and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. 
It's good to have Chasper and Shar back with us. Good to have Chasper Ruder back with us. Good to see you, sir. We've got this warm Floridian people coming back and bringing the warmth with them. It's really, really nice. I want to keep praying for Tracy Ostergaard. Tracy was in the hospital this week and had surgery on his arm, and he uh, has a machine that makes his arm go like this all day long and all night long, moving back and forth, but he's doing a lot better, so we're thankful for that. We're looking at a subject, continue to exalt him. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Just read this one verse. It says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I pray that you might reveal yourself to us. We don't have a, long, a lot of time for this message. And yet it's such an important message. We pray, Father, that you would just show us what you would have us to learn from the passage that we're looking at and many other verses that we'll look at this morning, how we can continue to praise you. Father, we're grateful for how you've provided every need and met each need that we have. Father, that you've comforted us, given us family and friends, given us a church where we can worship you and learn your word. But Father, help us to study it from your perspective, to see it as you see it, as you've said it to us, that we, Father, would have a great desire to put this in practice and to praise you with our lips. In your name we pray these things, amen. It says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice to God, or sacrifice of praise to God continually. In the subject of continue that we've been looking at throughout this whole year, I've said that so much of what the Christian life is has been delegated in the periods of time. We come and we have our one-hour worship service. We have our time of prayer before we eat, or time of prayer before we go to sleep. And it's about events. And God wants our life to be consistent, continuous. He wants us to continue to pray constantly. He wants us to be in a mindset of being sub in subordination to Him. But when it comes to praising Him, when it comes to using our mouth, I ask you the question, when do you praise God? When is it during your week, during your life, that you bring praise to God with your lips? Now, if you do it on Sunday morning, if you come to church and if you sing worthy of worship, worthy of praise, and you sing that with your mouth and with your heart, that's good. But understand that what this passage is saying is so important that we continue to do it continually. God created this world, and when He created this world in the very beginning, He knew exactly that you would be sitting here today. He knew little Gabriel would be here today. He knew that you would have a tremendous desire in your heart to be learning God's Word and praying today. And I imagine that brought great joy to God to think about you and the fact that you would be coming to church to learn more about Him. God has known all these things from the very beginning, but I want you to understand carefully that every single rock, the rain, the wind, the stars, the sun, the moon, every animal, every single thing and every part of creation has been designed by God to give glory to Him. When God is in the process of determining and deciding what He's going to be doing, He gave us mouths and gave us lips and gave us a mind and the purpose of the lips, the purpose of the tongue, the purpose of the mind was to recognize His glory and to be able to reveal that glory. And we come into church, we spend an hour in this talking about how good God is and how glorious God is and for the remainder of the six days of our life, of our week, it's all about man's glory. We're bombarded with man and his praise and man and his accomplishment, man and what he's doing. We have this time before God where we praise him and then the rest of the time is given to man and his praise. And I know that's not something we enjoy, but it's just the way this world is. God desires us 
He desires this people in this, wor- in this room to be continuous in praise to him. Now you can understand why it's such an issue, why it's such a huge issue when men try to work their way to heaven. Because work is all about man's glory. It's all about what man has accomplished, what man can do, and the good that man has. And it's all about bringing glory to man. And it's so opposed to what God is and what God has done in sending His Son to this earth that God might be glorified in His Son, Jesus Christ. As we gather around the table and the, and the cup today and the, and the broken bread, we're thinking about God and His glory, His majesty, His wonder. I have several points on this outline today, and again, we're having to, to drop many of these things, but let me just share with you a couple things by way of introduction. First of all, the word glory does not even appear in the Bible until Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus chapter 16, God reveals His glory to man. He starts to reveal Himself. When you talk about about Moses, Moses asks God, God, reveal Your glory to me. So God takes Moses and He places him in this cleft of a rock. And He places him there and He says, Moses, I'm going to pass by you and I'm going to let you see my glory. But you can't see my face for no man can see my face and live. So I'll put my hand over you as I pass by so you cannot see my face. And I will remove my hand as I pass by so you can see a little bit of my glory. And Moses was able to see a little bit of that glory, just a glimpse of it. Because God is so glorious you couldn't see it and live. And yet when you get to the New Testament, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And he says in verse 14 of John 1, he says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. God began to reveal how glorious He really was. And you could see just a bit of that glory in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament you could see Christ. If you have your Bibles, you look at Hebrews chapter 1 in verse 3. It says, Who being the brightness of His glory, who being the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, He sat down in the right hand of the majesty on high. Who's that talking about? It's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, who's being the brightness of His glory. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, I'm not going to have you turn to it, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, talks about the Lord when He returns, when He comes back again in the future. It says that this one that we saw as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of the Father with the angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. When he comes again the second time, he will come with the glory of the Father. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and I want you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 99, verse verse 5 and 9. The first point of my outline is we exalt God by being debased in his presence. What a strange thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says this. You don't have to turn to it, but it says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God. The verse is aorist, active, imperative. And that word imperative means that God is commanding you to glorify Him. He says, people in Calvary Baptist Church, glorify me. In the same way He might say, I want you to love me, command you to love Him. In the same way He may command you to obey Him, He says this, glorify me. It's one of God's great commandments to the church. And when God makes that commandment, it is undoubtedly something that we can control, something that we do we can glorify God. 
Psalm chapter 99, please, looking at this verse. Again, the first point, we exalt God by being debased in his presence. Psalm 99, verse 5. Boy, is this politically incorrect. But verse, nine of, of, or verse 5 of Psalm 99, it says, Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Verse 9, it says, Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. You say, well, pastor, that doesn't seem to say the same thing. His footstool, that is a sign of humility. Remember in the book of James where it says, Sit thou here on my footstool or under my footstool? That's a sign of humility. A footstool is someplace where you rest your feet. And God says, I want you to worship at my footstool. But I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. And of course, in this church, this is all about Bible. I don't think worshiping at God's holy hill is a sign of exaltation of man. It's a sign of man being debased. In Exodus chapter 19 in the Old Testament, we read these words which are very important. He says in verse 11 in Exodus 19, Be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourself that you go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth loud, they shall come up to the mount. Listen, God wants you to come to the mountain, but in the Old Testament, you were not able to come into the mountain to be with God because God is holy. The reason we are debased in His presence, the reason we worship at His footstool, is God is holy. The whole idea of salvation is that God is holy. In order for you to dwell in His presence, you must be holy. God is glorious. In order for you to live with a glorious God, you must be glorified. If you are not glorified, you cannot live with a glorified God. And God desires people to be debased in His presence. The problem is in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Every man will proclaim, every, or most men will proclaim every man his own goodness. And that's the problem of man. Man wants to proclaim how good he is. And God wants to exalt his throne. You can picture mankind today. Politically correct thinking is, you've got to feel good about yourself. You need more self-esteem you need that self-esteem so you'll be confident. Be confident around other people. You can speak out. You want that confidence when you play sports or confidence when you're addressing other people. You want that self-esteem. But I'm telling you this. There's no self-esteem in God's presence. Mankind, when he comes into God's presence, is debased. You cannot comprehend how glorious God is, and you cannot comprehend how sinful man is, and how much we do not deserve to come into the presence of God. First, the first thing I want to say on that subject, point number two in my outline is, man is justified by God's righteousness and not his own. I'm looking at Luke chapter 18, please. Friends, I think, about, I think about Dessaline going to Haiti. And being in Haiti and seeing all the devastation of Haiti. People who are missing feet or hands or arms or legs. We don't want to look at that. We don't want to see that. The people in our church want to be dressed up in ties and, and have their hair combed and, and look nice. They don't want to see the poverty of Haiti. That's difficult for us to take. When you come into God's presence, you come, cannot come into His presence being exalted. Those people in Haiti have the exact same God that you have. The exact same desire for Him. The exact same desire to know Him. 
Those people in Haiti have the exact same ability to come in prayer that you have. For some reason, Americans like to exalt themselves. And they just don't realize just how important it is to be debased in the presence of God. To not glorify man, but to glorify God. Luke chapter 18, there's a story about two people, and I want to tell you about these stories. One is Mr. Big and one is Mr. Small. We'll start with Mr. Big. Mr. Big is a very, very good man. And Mr. Big comes into the presence of God because Mr. Big is very assured in God's presence. He's very confident because he's trying to do what God said to do, and he's trying to please God, and he comes into the presence of God, and the first thing he says in God's presence is, I thank thee, God. A good way to start. Gets our attention, Mr. Big, when he comes into God's presence and he says, I thank thee, God. Then he looks around, and you can see him in his prayer. His eyes are open, and he's kind of scanning all the other people that are in that temple with him. He's a good man. He's gone to the temple to pray. His name's Mr. Big. And he looks around at all the people, and he says, I thank thee, God, that I'm not like these other people are. I thank thee that I'm not a publican. I thank thee that I'm not an extortioner. And he gives all these things that he hasn't done. And he's a good man because he hasn't done these things. Wonderful man. But you have another man in that story. The other man's name is Mr. Small. Of course, that's not what you find in the Bible. That's a name I gave him. But Mr. Small can't lift up his eyes to heaven. He can't even look up. His eyes are just pasted down on the floor. And Mr. Small thinks about the things he has done. And he's very debased in the presence of God. And all Mr. Small does is he smites upon his breast and he cries out, God be merciful to me. Now I find this interesting because in the Greek there is a definite article, the word the, ho in the Greek, And sometimes you have a definite article, sometimes you don't. In this particular case, you would assume that he would not have a definite article when he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But he doesn't say it that way. He says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. He uses a definite article, and I think that's interesting. God be merciful to me, the sinner. Because Mr. Small cannot see anyone else. He is not looking at the Pharisees, not looking at anybody The only thing Mr. Small can see is his own sin. And you got these two men, Mr. Big and Mr. Small. And Mr. Small has done a lot of things against God. But God created man to glorify him, not man. And God, our Lord Jesus Christ, turned to his disciples and said, Which of these two do you think went to his house justified? The third point I want you to think about, and we're running out of time here, but is God is not glorified in my glory. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 25. You know, I don't really have the time to hit every one of these verses, and I probably will come back and preach this message again, because it's just too important. O Lord, Thou art my God, I will exalt Thee. I will praise Thy name, for Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels are of old faithfulness and truth. You know what the word worship is in the Greek, in the New Testament? I think this is an interesting word. The New Testament word for for worship is the word proskunio. And the reason it's fascinating is the word cuneo comes from the word dog. It means dog. Pros cuneo means toward a dog. And the definition that the lexicon gives for the word worship in the New Testament is the dog that's licking your hand. A dog that's licking your hand. Now I've got this little dog, and he's got a much smaller brain than most dogs. His brain is very small. I haven't looked at it, but I'm not sure I'd find it if I looked. But his brain is made up half bark, half lick. 
half bark and half lick. And it's the thing about my dog that my son has a really difficult time with because <laughs> the dog loves to lick. And he loves to lick. And every once in a while, the dog will jump up in the back and he'll lick the back of my neck. <laughs> oh, that just drives you crazy. You can't stand that when he does that, when he licks the back of your neck. Could you, do you, would you like that? No, I didn't think so. Well, you swing at the thing. He's quicker than that, so he gets out of the way. But he loves, loves to lick your hand. He loves to lick your hand. And you say, why? What is the purpose of this? You know, taste the soap or to taste the grease from the car or the gasoline. I have all kinds. What does he do this for? Why, do you lick, why does a dog lick your hand? Isn't it fascinating that that's the word that God uses to talk about worship? You know, when we were at the Living Last Supper here this last week, and you watched those disciples getting their feet washed, that was amazing. That made me feel so uncomfortable. That Jesus would take and he would wash their feet and dry them. Man, I wouldn't want anyone to touch my feet or to wash my feet. Would you? It just seems so uncomfortable. God is not glorified in my sin. But I want you to understand this. God is not glorified in my glory either. When God talks about this, he says, he says let not the wise man glory in his, in his wisdom, neither let the, the rich man glory in his riches. But him that glorieth, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me. There are a couple words that are used in the Old Testament. The word is shakah, and it means to bow down, and segid, which means to fall prostrate. God is glorified when man glorifies in him. Now listen, I don't have much time to explain what I mean by this. But I want you to take your Bible and look with me at Psalm chapter 30, verse 12. And then I want you to look up here for just a second because I want to make this abundantly clear what I'm saying to you. I hope I can make it clear. God has given to every man in this room a glory. You have glory. God has given you glory. You are made in His image. God has given man great glory. It's a tra terrible tragedy when evolution says that man is the highest of all evolution. That's taking and putting all of that glory on man. But God did create man and he did give man glory. You read this verse, it says, To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee. You have a glory. But please understand what I'm saying, that God gave you glory for a purpose. Every single thing that God did in giving you hands and, and a mouth and ears was all designed for a purpose. That purpose is very important. That my glory is designed to give glory to God. When my glory gives glory to man, it is very defeating to the purposes of God. God wants me to glorify Him by the glory that He has given me. The ability to think, the ability to reason, the ability to search out God, the ability to pray, the ability to sing, the ability to speak. If man does not speak of God's glory, he glorifies himself in its absence because man has a glory. But that glory is given for a purpose that we might glorify Him. If we are silent, we begin to glorify man because man has a glory. Does that make sense? So God wants very much for creation to be able to glorify Him. All the trees, the sun, the moon, the stars... And the one creation that God has to give glory to him more than any other creation is man. 
Take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. In Isaiah 42.8, the Bible says God will not give his glory to another. God will not give his glory to another. You couple that together with every man will proclaim his own goodness. You can understand the problem. In Romans chapter 1, it says this, Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, made like to corruptible man. Man has a glory, but that glory has been given to man for a reason and for a purpose. God wants you to continually give praise to him with your mouth. I just want to close with this before the ushers or the deacons get ready for communion. I just want to close with this. There's only a short amount of time that you have to glorify him for salvation. I want you to consider the fact that in heaven you will never witness again. You will never open your lips to worship God again. God has given you an opportunity right now to glorify him with your lips. And it's the purpose for which those lips were created. In heaven for eternity will glorify him. But this is the only time you have to glorify him before unsaved people. The only time you have to be able to witness of God's glory to people who don't know that glory. I'd like to have you bow your heads and close your eyes, please. And as we pray, I'd like to have the deacons prepare themselves. Father, we have an incredible message here today that we have a God in heaven who deserves to be glorified by our lips but it's not something that we do just once a week in an hour in church but this glorifying you should be something that we do every day every moment that our lips were designed to give glory to you and father I just pray that you would help us to see those opportunities that you've given to us to use our lips for that reason for the purpose for which they were created that we would be continually giving thanks to you giving praise to you and father there's someone here today who may not know you as savior and I pray father that they would see the importance of having to be perfect to get to heaven and they're not perfect that you are glorious and they're not they have sinned and they've come short of that glory. Father, that they would seek you as the one who died on the cross for them to give them eternal life, a gift of eternal life. And Father, we pray that this glory would be revealed even in the cup and in the bread, that we could glorify you for what you've done in sending your son to this earth. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Come drink, cried out in.
mine might be dried, stripped of glory that I might be clothed, crushed by your Every morning His mercies 
Okay. 
Thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We hope it was a blessing to you. You know, the greatest need that we have in our life is to come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Churchianity is not Christianity. Just because you go to church, just because you're baptized, does not mean you know Christ the Savior. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that we have to be perfect to get to heaven. And no matter how many good things you do, you can never become perfect. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and He died upon the cross to pay for your sin. When He took your sin, He also gave you His righteousness. The Bible says that He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's why the Bible also says, For God made Him Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, this would be a great time for you to put your trust in Christ by receiving His free gift, by putting your trust in Him, the one who died on the cross for you. If there's anything we can do to help you, please give us a call. We'd love to help you come to know Christ, to know Him better, and also make Him known to others. You know, if you love Christ, you also love His body. And of course, His body is the church. And so if you don't have a church that you attend, we invite you to come and visit us at Calvary Baptist Church this week. Our service times are 9.30 and 10.30 for our worship service, and Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We'd enjoy seeing you this Sunday.